Let's get started. Let us pray. Eternal God, in whose perfect kingdom no sword is drawn but the sword of righteousness, no strength known but the strength of love, so mightily spread abroad your Holy Spirit that all peoples may be gathered under the banner of the Prince of Peace, to whom be dominion and glory now and forever. Amen. Again, welcome to Women Together, especially for all the people who are coming in as I started. The theme for Women Together at St. Paul's is being a Christian woman in a diverse world. During this series, we seek to dip, deepen our faith as we interact with the rest of the world. We're grateful that we can share this journey with you. I wanna give a special welcome to women who are attending for the first time. <laughs> there are, I think, a few this time. Um, we have seven meetings a year and on the first Thursday of each month from October until May, that's our season. You just have to check the Women Together webpage on the stpaulcathedral.org website or watch for publicity each month. Women Together isn't something that you join. You watch for publicity each month, you sign up by the Monday prior to the Thursday meeting and you come. Um, you can bring a friend, all women are welcome. And I wanna take a moment to thank all the dedicated volunteers and the cathedral staff and clergy who make this event possible. Um, it takes a lot of people to put together these events and I really appreciate all of the volunteer time that people put in. So our speaker tonight is Dr. Emily Reimer Berry. Um, Dr. Emily Reimer Berry is an associate professor in the Department of Theology and Religious Studies at the University of San Diego. She's wrapping up a five-year term as the department chair this spring. She teaches courses in Catholic theological ethics, including se sexual ethics, feminist ethics, war and peace, Christian change makers, and ethical responses to HIV and AIDS. Dr. Reimer Berry writes from the perspective of a feminist Catholic woman whose faith is deeply shaped by feminist spirituality and reflection on embodiment and discourses of power. Recent publications include a book chapter and an intersectional view of love in marriage for sex, love, and families, Catholic perspectives. Um, a plenary address at the Catholic Theological Society of America in 2019 annual convention, and a manuscript, um, Catholic Theology of Marriage in the era, the era of HIV and AIDS, Marriage for Life in Lexington Books. Dr. Reimer Berry is a regular contribu contributor to CatholicMoralTheology.com, which is a blog, as well as the forum blog at Catholic Theological Ethics in the World Church. You can tell she does a lot of work around ethics. <laughs> Um, she served on the planning committee of the two-year grant-funded program co-creating the future of faith, women in the Catholic Church, which recommended to the Bishop of San Diego a model for decision-making in the Catholic Church where the voices of women are adequately represented in a governance structure that is diverse, transparent, ethical, and accountable. She lives with her family in Chula Vista, California. So please welcome Dr. Emily Reimer Berry. Thank you so much. It's really a joy to be with all of you tonight. Um, I want to thank uh, Virginia and Nancy and all of the organizers of tonight's event for the invitation to join you and, and speak to you about this very pressing moral issue, racism. Uh, I'm going to share my screen now and hope that I can get a little bit of feedback to indicate that you can see this. Let's see. Are you able to see my slides? Great. Okay. So I'm going to talk tonight about racism. I want to acknowledge first that Depending on your positionality, this may be more difficult for some to hear than others. 
If you encounter anti-Black racial oppression every day, that trauma is real. I encourage anyone triggered tonight to pay attention and prioritize your own self-care. I'm gonna describe the scope of the problem using not just sociological evidence and historical analysis, but also theological reflection. And ultimately, my goal in doing so is to invite all of us, myself included, to recommit to the ongoing task of becoming anti-racist. And let me reiterate from the beginning that it is a lifelong ongoing struggle. You may have noticed that I'm white. I describe myself as white, cisgender, heterosexual, feminist, Catholic, theologian, parent, sister, mother. So I will be approaching the sin of racism from the perspective of a white person who needs to both learn and unlearn in my journey of becoming anti-racist. I need to unlearn harmful scripts, including theological claims about God and humanity that have been part of my moral formation. And I need to learn how to center the lives of people of color in a world where white voices continue to dominate. I need to learn how to be anti-racist and in the words of the late John Lewis, to get into good trouble. Standpoint epistemology involves consideration of how my knowledge is dependent on my own context, embodiment and life experience. It's important for me to be honest with you about the baggage that I bring to this discussion. I grew up in Mobile, Alabama, where the last slave ship brought cargo of enslaved Africans aboard the Clotilda in 1859. The walking map on this slide identifies the distance between my high school, McGill Tulin Catholic High School, and the site of the lynching of Michael Donald in 1981 when I was a child. Some of you might be familiar with the gruesome story of Michael Donald's lynching, which is the focus of the CNN docuseries, The People Versus the Klan, now streaming on CNN. I'm ashamed to say that I learned of the lynching of Michael Donald when I was an adult. His story was not part of my community's experience of growing up in Mobile. And by that, I mean my white community's experience. In ways I did not perceive at the time, whiteness shielded me from the racial trauma some of my neighbors experienced every day. One of the things I continue to struggle with is the fact that I may cause harm to others even when I have good intentions or when I do not intend to cause harm to another. I'm also struggling with the fact that um, it was in part because of my shaping and my formation um, as a Christian that I didn't know about the lynching of Michael Donald. So I'm asking questions, you know, not only about my own complicity, but my church's complicity in my moral blindness. During my senior year of high school, I was an Azalea trail maid. Believe it or not, it was seen as quite an honor in my hometown. Basically 100 female high school students were selected and we dressed up in antebellum dresses and made frequent appearances at civic functions and holiday parades. Our outfit included antebellum hoop dress, lace hat, parasol, lace gauntlets, cummerbund, bow, pantaloons, and shoes dyed to match our dress color. We were instructed to always act like a lady, which meant, according to the pink book, do not under any circumstances complain that you are tired, uncomfortable, hot, cold, or anything to a visitor. Learn to smile under all conditions. Talk about Emily, socialization. I, I'm sorry to interrupt Emily, but I think, I don't know if your slides are showing properly. Um, I don't know. I, um, we're, we still have the, the screen that has your slides on the side and just the, the, the first slide, I think. And I, I don't know if you had meant to. Um, yes, thank you so much for interrupting me because I do want to be sure that you can see these. Okay. okay. Yay. Can you see that one now? Yes, yes. Uh, okay. Mobile Azalea Trail Maids. Is so, that you? So pre, prior to that one, it was this slide that had the map that shows it was 0.6 miles from my high school to the lynching site of Michael Donald. Thank you. I do apologize about that. Thank you for interrupting me. So now I believe 
we are on track and you can see this one. Uh, sorry, the, the one that I see says Azalea Trail Mate of the Week. Yes. Okay. Mobile Field Azalea Trail Mates is what it says, yes. That's right, yes, okay. So um, thank you for stopping me. So this next one, let's see. Yep, this is where I am now. Okay, so I never intended to cause harm to someone else when I was an Azalea Trail maid. I thought of myself as a nice Christian, but I was participating in the whitewashing of a very brutal history. While the Azalea Trail maids had been integrated for many years before I joined their ranks in 1995, the whole idea of teenage ambassadors dressed as plantation owners from the antebellum South is its own kind of revisionist history. As an Azalea trail maid, I would stand outside old plantation homes for garden parties, fundraisers, flower festivals, and the like, without ever mentioning the dehumanizing violence that was forced upon enslaved peoples on those plantations 150 years earlier. Why did I participate in such a strange and deeply offensive tradition rooted in unspoken nostalgia masked as civic pride? I didn't think to question this tradition. I was socialized to accept it as normal. It took me a long time to begin to see my privileges and to recognize the invisible systems of oppression that operate as normal in our world. Today, I profess that Black Lives Matter. I'm trying to become anti-racist and I keep messing up. I still have a lot to both learn and unlearn. So tonight I'm gonna to walk through some of the ways that theological education has contributed to the problem of anti-Black racism and uncover what I call anti-racist alternatives. But I also want to encourage us not only to begin to change the way that we think, but also to begin to think about how we might change our behavior. So I'm gonna define some terms and then describe some white lies in Christian theology. Um, this is what we call racist ideas in Christian theology, some anti-racist alternatives, um, some of the principles that can uh, propose a different way forward and end with the challenge of becoming anti-racist today. When we look at these images, gruesome images of raci racial violence, I want us to think about how we might use the category of sin to talk about what we see. And it's complicated because sin is a complex theological category. In the top left, we have um, Derek Chauvin uh, kneeling on the neck of George Floyd. On the bottom left, we have um, uh, protesters in Selma being beaten. And on the right, we have the lynching of Leach Daniels in Texas. Gruesome images of racial violence that challenge our uh, emotions, and yet how do we use this, this category of sin talk to describe what we see? Sin is a theological category. In scripture, we see a variety of understandings, from missing the mark, to a deliberate action violating community norms, to a failure to love. Too often, I, in my view, Christians focus on a legalistic understanding, seeing sin as breaking rules. A focus on personal sin tends to emphasize human freedom, so freely choosing to do what one knows to be wrong. But research on unconscious bias challenges this category. Theologians have drawn renewed attention to the structural dimensions of sin, social sin, including how we are formed as moral agents in a broken world. So there's not one way to talk about sin, but one feature that we tend to see is that sin talk describes a situation of broken relationships, including broken human relationships and also a rupture between human relationships and God. When we think about racism, these three books are ones that I've found to be particularly helpful and I'll uh, refer to them um, in uh, the rest of the talk as well. So Ijeoma Olua defines racism as a prejudice against someone based on race when those prejudices are reinforced by systems of power. Dr. Brian Massingale defines racism as an underlying color symbol system that first justifies race-based disparities, 
Second shapes not only behavior, but also one's identity and consciousness. And third often operates at a pre-conscious or non-rational level that escapes personal awareness. Ibram X. Kendi defines a racist idea as any idea that suggests one racial group is inferior or superior to another racial group in any way. Kendi defines racism as a marriage of racist policies and racist ideas that produces and normalizes racial inequities. And I understand race to be a social political construct, not a biological reality. Because of the way that it shapes our identities and behaviors, we need to examine how race functions in our social world. Racism has personal, interpersonal, and structural dimensions. And I see the influence of sin talk as necessarily on each of those dimensions. So describing um, racism, not exclusively in the personal sin category, but also in interpersonal and structural dimensions. When we think about whiteness, my colleague Karen Teal at USD is an expert in Catholic approaches to whiteness, which she defines as a system of hegemonic power that operates to benefit people perceived to be white and to disadvantage people perceived to be of color. Dr. Teal notes that white people have a notoriously difficult time seeing whiteness, for we are barely aware of ourselves as raced. White privilege is the related term which names the reality in the US context that to be white is to have unbelievable power, power that is unearned and undeserved and unjust and typically to be virtually unaware of it. Teal does not claim that white people today created these structures, but she does claim that white supremacy is evident in the pernicious structures that white people refuse to dismantle. Examples of racism abound in 2021. It isn't just the rise of white nationalism and alt-right hate groups, as troubling as those are. It is also new evidence of health disparities, including evidence that racial and ethnic minority groups are being disproportionately affected by COVID-19. We see racism in the school to prison pipeline, underfunded public education, and racialized differences in access to online learning in COVID-19. After the death of George Floyd and the groundswell of protests around the country in the summer of 2020, Business Insider put together a series of 26 infographics that demonstrate the stark differences between black and white experiences in the US because of systemic racism. <clears throat> for example, the poverty rate for black families is over twice that for white families. The share of black households who own their own homes is lower than other racial groups. Black men are roughly five times more likely to be imprisoned than their white counterparts. We live in a racist society in which racial groups do not have equal access to goods for human flourishing. Anyone living in this society, no matter their own embodiment and racial experience, is socialized and malformed by the racism of our country. White Christians must confess our racism, acknowledge how our bias feeds racist systems, and work to eliminate it. This is the work of anti-racism. Now, before white Christians can do the work of anti-racism, we have to recognize the racist ideas and assumptions that continue to shape contemporary Christian theology. We have to unlearn racist theological constructions about God, the human condition, and human society. And of course, this is a tall order and more than I can do in a single talk. So I'm gonna give a broad overview about some of the assumptions that are problematic. So white lie number one, God is white. The first bit of unlearning of racist thoughts that white Christians need to do is to unlearn the image of God as white and male. To claim that God is white is idolatrous. It is in Kendi's language, a racist thought. But I will warn you, once you become conscious of this, you will see it everywhere, in children's picture Bibles, in religious art, in pop culture, a particularly poignant account from fiction is the conversation between Seeley and Shug in Alice Walker's brilliant novel, The Color Purple. 
next, Chug says, tell me what your God looked like, Seely. Oh no, I say, I'm too shame. Nobody ever asked me this before, so I'm sort of took by surprise. Besides, when I think about it, it don't seem quite right. But at all I got, I decide to stick up for him just to see what Shug say. Okay, I say, he big and old and tall and gray bearded and white. He wear white robes and go barefooted. So that's a conversation between Shug and Seely in the novel. As the conversation moves forward, Shug helps Seely to see how this understanding of God benefits white people and oppresses black people. Shug helps Seely to learn new ways of talking about God, new ways of envisioning God. For Shug, God is neither white nor male. The great black liberation theologian, James Halcone, identified how the whiteness of Jesus functioned to sanctify white supremacy. But of course, Jesus of Nazareth was not white. He was a first century Jew living near Jerusalem, probably with darker skin and definitely not of the ruling class. The main point here is that the way we imagine God matters. So we need to do work in our theological imagination and visioning of God. White lie number two, thinking of salvation as purely personal. If by salvation you mean that you are saved by faith in Christ, or you are able to get to heaven experienced as a personal victory, then you might not be socialized to consider the implications of salvation as liberation from oppression and the social justice that is the fruit of right relationship with God and with your neighbors. You may think that all you need to do is to pray directly to God and you'll be fine. In my church, Catholic sacramental theology unfortunately feeds this problematic worldview when it renders sin exclusively as a personal failure to love God, self, and others. The sacraments of reconciliation and Eucharist sometimes fall into this trap of a person-centered spirituality. Consider, for example, how inadequate our approach to anti-Black racism has been and that we have no way of confessing it liturgically except as personal sin and private confession. So white lie number three, the dualism that associates light with goodness and dark with evil. Too often, whiteness is a stand-in for pure, unblemished, free of sin and holy, while darkness connotes evil or the demonic. While this socialization is often unconscious, we can and should bring it into our awareness. Scholars such as Leonard McKinnis and Robin Hawley Gorslin explain the problem in this way, and this is Gorslin's words. Theologians, and not just white ones, are often unaware of how language of light and dark, particularly language that promotes enlightenment over an alternative and negative darkness, perpetuates and recreates a cultural value of light over dark. In a Christian context, exalting Christ as the light of the world creates a connection of holiness with light. Even when there is no explicit mention of darkness as unholy, this usage reifies the theological and cultural dualism of light over dark. And um, she connects this to the dualisms present in Eurocentric theology of male and female, white and black, straight and gay, rich and poor. And in each case, there's a power imbalance between those two parts of the dualisms. White line number four, distorting scripture to support white power. Seemingly obscure stories in the Bible have had enormous impacts on the Christian imagination. Take, for example, the curse of Ham as told in Genesis 9. The story begins with Ham, the father of Canaan, seeing his father's nakedness, for which a drunk Noah wakes up to curse Ham and bless Shem and Japheth. Cursed be Canaan, the lowest of slaves shall he be to his brothers. This text was used as justification for the human institution of Chattel slavery. So too, the letters of Paul and those attributed to him, Ephesians and Colossians, also are sometimes taken uncritically and out of context um, in a way that seem to affirm slavery or apply that to today, such as slaves obey your earthly masters, Ephesians 6, 5. 
So even though slavery in the first century Roman Empire was very different than the enslavement of native peoples and the colonization of the Americas, these texts were used as justification of God's divine plan. And what remains problematic about these texts is how they were restated uncritically and applied by whites in the US to legitimate their social power and to make the false theological claim that the enslavement of African peoples was justified by the Bible. White lie number five, tradition. This is the way we've always done it, so this must be God's will. Theological method includes the interpretation of the Bible, tradition, and human experience. Sometimes though, tradition is invoked uncritically. Some will say that tradition contains the wisdom of our forefathers in faith and tradition cannot err. Black Catholic theologian, Diana Hayes and her history of Catholic teachings on slavery explains that the Catholic faithful and hierarchy interpreted not only scripture and tradition, but papal and curial statements to fit their own situations and understandings. She continues, theologians believe that sacred scripture, especially the writings of St. Paul and tradition and a seemingly unbroken line from the early church fathers through the popes and councils supported slavery. This is how the Holy Office came to say in 1866, quote, slavery itself is not at all contrary to the natural and divine law. So tradition is thus used to justify unjust uh, distribution of power and material goods. Arguments invoking the natural law claim that there is a natural ordering of God's creation. So when applied by white Christians to the enslavement of peoples, the natural law was invoked to say that some people were created to serve others and that that was part of God's design. To the extent that some people today claim that human dignity should not yield equal power, this assumption persists today. White lay number six, good Christians obey the law. This idea is connected to the earlier example of how white Christians have distorted the message of the Bible to solidify their own social power in the US context. When good order is privileged over justice, this is a distortion of the Bible's understanding of right relationship. But we see this repeatedly from the white pastors Dr. King admonished in his letter from a Birmingham jail to the speech of former Attorney General Jeff Sessions, who invoked Romans 13 to justify his zero tolerance approach to immigration on the US-Mexico border and the resulting family separation policy, which made it a criminal act to seek uh, asylum in the United States. White line number seven, there's nothing more important than your happiness. Perhaps this is where white people with privilege will experience the most discomfort, but I'm proposing that the Christian life of discipleship is actually not about the pursuit of happiness at all. Rather, it's about following Jesus, who said himself that in order to get it right, one must be willing to take up one's cross. White Christians with power have been all too comfortable with the suffering of others, including the suffering of black and brown bodies, but rarely adopt an understanding of the importance of personal sacrifice for the greater good as essential to one's discipleship. If we only see God as a comfort, as someone helping us to have good excuses to keep up our blinders or remain complacent about other people's suffering, then we've accepted a false understanding of the mission of the church today. And white line number eight, abortion is the preeminent moral issue. When US Catholic bishops declare abortion to be the preeminent moral issue, they are not only making claims about the value of fetal life, but they are forming political allegiances in a US society that is deeply divided and increasingly partisan and polarized. I've argued elsewhere that this is a pattern of behavior going back to the 1970s. When they initiated a strategy of endorsing a single issue approach to election politics. So from the 1970s on, the bishops have focused on abortion policies, for example, in their analysis of candidates for office. Now they've restated the need to give urgent attention and priority to abortion as a life issue. But of course, when abortion is called a pre preeminent priority, then other issues are not given the same attention. 
So in my view, this is what makes it racist. The scandal of suffering experienced by people of color and systemic racism in US society for some Catholic leaders is not deemed an urgent enough priority. And we should keep asking why this is. Racism is also reinforced by both sidesism, which is a pattern that we see in their public statements on police violence and police reform. So then in the midst of these, um, what I call you know, white lies or racist assumptions embedded in um, the constructs of our theology and liturgical imagination, how are we to respond? Well, I have some alternatives to pose very briefly um, for each of the um, pieces that I've already identified. So the first is that God is not white. So an anti-racist theology of God recognizes that all language for God is metaphor and that God cannot be contained by human language or the human imagination. To paraphrase St. Augustine, if you think you understand God, that's not God. We need to untangle our theology of God from whiteness so that the symbol of God functions again as a symbol system that discloses the sacred who is beyond names and beyond color. And at the same time that we say that God is beyond embodiment and beyond color, we need to expand our theological imagination and adopt the symbols of God incarnated as black and marginalized. Black womanist and Latin American liberation theologians have been inviting white scholars to do this work for decades. James Halcone, Jacqueline Grant, Kelly Brown Douglas, John Sabrino, Gustavo Gutierrez, and many others have been inviting us to do this work. We need to catch up in our sacred art and architecture, liturgical music, and in our language. When we see the face of Christ in the black teenager brutally shot by law enforcement, this speaks to the reality of God's presence in our world. Second, faith is not exclusively personal. Human persons are social by nature. We learn about God through faith communities and faith should never be misconstrued as exclusively personal. So the theology of the church is a helpful corrective here. We don't get to the presence of God alone by ourselves. We learn about God through relationships with other people in a community of believers struggling forward as the pilgrim, of, as the pilgrim church. So no one says this better than Dr. King who connected the mission of the church to social justice movements as this quote on the slide says, we must come to see that the Christian gospel is a two way road. On the one side, it seeks to change the souls of men and thereby unite them with God. On the other, it seeks to change the environmental conditions of men so that the soul will have a chance after it is changed. Any religion that professes to be concerned with the souls of men and yet is not concerned with the economic and social conditions that strangle them and the social conditions that cripple them is the kind the Marxist describes as an opiate of the people. Briefly for number three, dualisms fail to adequately attend to human experience. Um, on top of that, we can say black is beautiful. All dualisms can be dangerous because they oversimplify. What is inherently complex, they oversimplify and they create power structures that divide. There are plenty of ways that light can damage and countless examples of black is beautiful. The cultural movement known as Black is Beautiful articulates the theological truth that Black bodies are inherently beautiful. And this movement is used to counteract racist ideas that white skin and white features are more desirable. So Black Futurism is one example of a movement that you might be interested in. Um, Beyonce, uh, the singer and um, artist, dancer, um, her one example is the gift. Um, if you're interested in looking up Beyonce's, the gift is an example of the celebration of um, Black history, Black culture, and Black is beautiful. Another anti-racist framing um, is to say that scripture supports liberation. So the Bible is the word of God and the words of men. It's a collection of books 
written a long time ago in different social contexts, and it must be interpreted and analyzed. At the same time, Black theologians invite us to interpret the motif of liberation in the Bible through the lens of their ongoing freedom struggle. In this interpretation, God is on the side of the oppressed, seeking liberation from all forms of domination, exploitation, and oppression. Another anti-racist framing is to say that tradition is dynamic and to say that natural law opposes, um, sorry, how did I frame it on that slide? Uh, natural law supports equality. So traditions are complex, nonlinear, and dynamic. So an important question that we need to ask in the context of exploring the racism of Christianity is to, to ask whose tradition, whose stories have been told, whose experiences are accounted for. Because if we've only attended to white stories and white voices, that's not theology, that's white theology. Scholars of the natural law today point out that church teaching on enslavement of peoples did change over time, and that contemporary natural law theology is the foundation for universal claims about human rights discourse and equality. It's important to realize that some popes in the past got it wrong. Lay and religious activists and saints through the years have often been very influential in reshaping church teachings gradually, initiating cultural shifts. A lesson here for us is summed up in Dorothy Day's advice to a young racial justice activist in Mobile, Alabama. You don't need permission to do good. The gospel gives you that freedom. You don't have to wait for the Pope to give you permission to follow your conscience and do what you know to be right. Another uh, anti-racist alternative is no justice, no peace. Catholic theologian David DeCoss explains the, the double meaning of this protest slogan. So first, it calls attention to the scandal of chronic injustice. Consider, for example, the death of George Floyd by Derek Chauvin. This slogan says, if justice isn't done in the face of this chronic injustice, we, these protesters, we, the protesters, are going to keep disturbing the peace. So no justice, no peace. Second, the expression speaks to a basic moral logic. Without justice, it's not possible to have true peace. It's the second meaning that finds textual support in the biblical tradition and the teachings of popes who wrote on social issues, including Pope Paul VI, who is shown here, who wrote, if you want peace, work for justice. In that encyclical on peacemaking, the Pope was drawing attention to the biblical understanding of peace as the fruit of right relationships. Thus, the goal is not order or stability for its own sake, as we sometimes see in scripts of you know, law and order politics, but rather the challenge is to build human community rooted in just relationships so that all people can flourish. It's important in this context that we don't rush to racial reconciliation before we have true racial justice. Justice requires repair of the harm that has been done. And finally, not a focus on happiness, but on Christian hope. So yes, we could say God wants us to be happy, but God does not want me to be happy at the expense of someone else's suffering. The goal should not be happiness, but mutual flourishing. And to get there, Dr. Brian Massingale explains, we must cultivate a sense of hope. Hope is not the same thing as optimism. Optimism is an American virtue. The American myth is that good always prevails over evil. The good guys always win and sooner rather than later. Optimists believe that the victories are low cost. Optimists believe that all difficulties will work out well. Hope is very different. Christian hope believes that ultimately good triumphs over evil, but not always. And that the victories often come at a terrible cost. In the process, we will pay a very high price. In the words of Arthur Falls, 
an African-American civil rights activist and member of the Chicago Catholic Worker in the 1960s. When asked what gave him hope in the struggle for justice, he replied, when you work for justice, you don't always lose. So Dr. Massengale here is saying Christian hope is a more important focus than personal happiness. And finally, racism is a preeminent life issue. Anti-Black racism deserves urgent attention. Too many are saying, I can't breathe. And that needs to be seen as a life question. So some of the principles that um, pastors within my church community have been invoking in order to address um, anti-racist, sorry, anti-Black racism um, are the principle of human dignity. So this principle says that all persons are made in the image and likeness of God. And you see some citations here for textual follow-up within Catholic encyclicals if you're interested. Um, the principle that uh, is called preferential option for the poor and vulnerable. And this principle says that we have a moral responsibility to care for the needs of the economically poor and those who are most in need. It's kind of like a triage situation. We care for those who are most urgently in need right now. This is also the principle that we hear invoked saying God's on the side of the poor against the injustice that they face. So it's very appropriate to claim Black Lives Matter in the context of this principle um, of option for the vulnerable. In common good, we have an obligation to look out not only for our own needs, but for the needs of the collective, the good of the whole, or the good of the collective. And solidarity, we're one human family and we need to work together across the barriers that seem to divide us. So these principles of human dignity, option for the vulnerable, common good and solidarity have been invoked by Catholic leaders. But I would still say that the Catholic church is um, behind where it should be, and we really should be more at the forefront of this uh, anti-Black racism, um, uh, sorry, anti-racist work. Pope Francis has also been trying to join, uh, to um, get attention to this issue. He said, addressing all dear brothers and sisters in the United States during his live stream general audience, uh, June 3rd. Today, I joined the church in St. Paul in Minneapolis and in the entire United States in praying for the repose of the soul of George Floyd and of all those others who have lost their lives as a result of the sin of racism. My friends, we cannot tolerate or turn a blind eye to racism and exclusion in any form and yet claim to defend the sacredness of every human life. We still have a lot of work to do in my faith community. So how might I begin? Well, one of the books that I found particularly helpful in um, developing my own uh, awareness, a growing awareness of my whiteness and um, of, of um, the possibilities of becoming more anti-racist is the book, So You Wanna Talk About Race by Ijeoma Olua. I referred to this book earlier. And she asks this very provocative question by the, uh, at the end of the book on page 220. She invites the person who's reading it to you know, really think about this question. Do you want to look like a better person or do you want to be a better person? So you might've heard the term um, virtue signaling, you know, where you signal to someone else how virtuous you are. You know, you're all at a talk right now. Um, uh, you know, you're learning how to be anti-racist. You must be a very good person. You must be a very good Christian. So the first lesson for white allies is that we have a lot of work to do, and it might be helpful for us to think about the difference between whether we want to look like better people or whether we want to really be better people. And the nuance between that is, um, I think, an important challenge uh, for each of us. So as I think, no, I don't just want to look like a better person. I don't just want to perform being better. I want to actually be better. So what does that look like? I know in my own life, it means thinking through my thoughts and my practices. It means apologizing. It means understanding the hurt that I've caused. Um, and it means uh, leaning into uncomfortable situations um, and recognizing 
um, that I don't know at all. And I need to unlearn a lot of harmful patterns. One of the things that I find really helpful in this book is the way that she has examples of microaggressions. Some of these questions or comments or um, things that you might've heard or um, you know, even witnessed in everyday life. So asking a person of color, are you the first person in your family to graduate from college? Are you an affirmative action hire? Saying you aren't like other black people I've met or you know, saying I can't pronounce your name so I'm gonna give you a new one. Um, saying you're so articulate, which of course comes with, it, it's labeled a microaggression because it comes with assumptions that that's not what you would have expected. And then asking someone who's in your neighborhood, are you lost? Olua explains that microaggressions are small, hence micro, and yet they compound over time. They're cumulative. They're used by people in power to police the behavior of others, and they often result from unconscious bias, meaning that you may not be aware you're hurting someone by those words. So if someone tells you that they're offended by what you have said, it's important to apologize. It takes energy for them to stand up for their dignity, and it takes time for us to learn new habits. Alua explains, don't force people to acknowledge your good intentions. What matters is that somebody was hurt. That should be the primary focus. The fact that you hurt someone doesn't mean that you're a horrible person, but the fact that you mean well doesn't absolve you of guilt. I find that straightforward analysis to be really compelling, at least for me. I know I need to unlearn some of the patterns um, and to work through some of these, um, you know, some of these uh, strategies. So to return to Kendi, someone who is anti-racist opposes racist ideas and racist policies. Kendi calls us to engage in personal work towards structural change. And this aligns with a Christian social vision of the human person and human community as well. So tonight I've invited us to pay attention to problematic white lies embedded in Christian theology, but also to counteract those with anti-racist responses drawn from the best of the Christian tradition. I want to end by saying that it's not enough to change the way that we think, actions and structural change must be our goal. An important part of that for white people is to center black and brown voices in the discussion. White Christians like me need to listen. I need time for critical self-reflection. We need to repent and we need to change the way that we think, pray, worship, and act. Book clubs can be spaces of consciousness raising conversations for white Christians committed to learning what racial justice praxis looks like. I want to remind, you know, white people like me that it's not the job of black community members to teach us about racism. They have enough on their plate already. White people need to take the initiative to learn and there are lots of great resources out there. So another um, action step is to join local movements that are initiated by um, BIPOC leaders. The National Bailout is a black led and black centered collective of abolitionist organizers, lawyers and activists building a community based movement to support the black community and end systems of pretrial detention and ultimately mass incarceration. So they have a campaign going right now if you haven't heard of it called um, the free black mamas for Mother's Day. So as we approach Mother's Day this weekend, you might consider participating or at least learning more about the national bailout to bail mothers out of jail. Every day, tens of thousands of people are in jail simply because they cannot afford bail. In addition to the over $9 billion wasted to incarcerate people who have not been convicted of crime, pretrial incarceration has catastrophic impacts on families and communities and on black communities in particular. Black people are over two times more likely to be arrested and once arrested are twice as likely to be incarcerated before trial. So you could celebrate Mother's Day weekend by helping to bail moms out of jail so that they can spend time with their families. An intersectional approach to social justice activism is really important. And tonight I've highlighted um, anti-black racism and my white privilege. 
But of course, living in San Diego, there's much more to say about ways to privilege Latinx, Asian, Pacific Islander, the LGBTQ community, and other marginalized voices. Perhaps other speakers in the series can address this better than I, um, to be sure that we're addressing that intersectional perspective. But I wanna close by saying, you know, my suggestion is to start from where you are and ask yourself what racist policies perpetuate white power from wherever you are? And how might you use your power to be able to listen, learn, and center the voices of people of color? I'm still learning myself and I'm committed to doing this work um, with my peers. So at USD, we've been working to expand the canon and our department course offerings. Um, so we know that we still have a lot of work to do, but one of the things that we've prioritized is looking through our curriculum, asking questions like, do students have the opportunity to build skills in community organizing and nonviolent protest? Um, also, how can I better support and nourish affinity groups on campus? So these are groups like the Black Student Union and the Latinx Fellowship. Um, the literature shows that if students of color feel a sense of belonging, including student affinity groups that are well supported, then they're more likely to experience deeper friendships on campus and be able to navigate structures of support when they experience anti-Black racism. So also thinking through what it means to be test blind or test optional um, so that standardized tests um, are not used in a way that's racist um, for scholarship awards or admissions. So just thinking through those practical dimensions of whether it's hiring or mentoring um, or support um, within the workplace, but we could also think about um, these practices of listening and centering, um, listening to, learning from and centering the voices of people of color um, as we continue. So thank you for this opportunity to speak with you tonight. And I look forward to uh, the dialogue and the Q&A. Wow, um, this is just an absolutely powerful um, talk. Um, so please, um, if people have questions, um, suggestions, go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, I'm seeing a bunch of thank yous. I put in um, an amens. <laughs> Um, I, I put in a couple of uh, things where you made references, um, but I just want to um, uh, remind everybody that we are recording this. We have recorded this talk and we'll be putting it up on the cathedral website on the Women Together page. Um, and uh, I think that, Emily, this was a uh, dense with fabulous information and deep thinking. And it's, it's um, I'm going to, want to actually watch the video again to make sure that I've really absorbed things. I took a ton of notes and um, I still um, feel like there was so much here that was um, really, really needed. meaty. Someone says, I feel like I have, or Anita says, I feel like I've just att attended a spiritual feast. <laughs> so um, uh, let's see, Terry, um, do you want to pass some of the questions from the chat on to uh, Emily? Absolutely. A lot of very positive um, responses. The first question I hear is from Virginia. How can we support affinity groups on campuses for people of color? That's a wonderful question. So um, one of the ways to learn more about the affinity groups is to go to the websites um, of the different uh, programs and to see the kinds of um, conversations that they're already uh, you know, the kinds of programs that they've already started. And um, then often they're looking for opportunities for mentoring. Um, often they're looking for opportunities for collaboration. So sometimes that looks like, you know, a, a, an informal mentoring process. Um, if you have skills and you're interested in, you know, offering those skills to a group of college students, um, then they're often very interested in that kind of collaboration. But then there are other ways to just support them by um, telling them that you support them because sometimes they don't know that other groups support them and, unless you um, reach out and indicate that. And, and college can already be a very alienating time for students of color. Um, 
I don't know if you're familiar with how the cost of textbooks has really um, skyrocketed, for example. And so what we found um, more recently is that one of the things we're trying to do is work with our librarians to be sure that the textbooks that are assigned are also available for students in the library. But we wouldn't have known about some of those issues of access if it wasn't for the advocacy of some of the student leaders on campus and some of the student leaders from those affinity groups are already doing a great job of raising their voice on behalf of other students. So, um, you know, part of it is just expressing support, learning more about what they're doing. Um, and then, you know, you might learn about some of the events that they're holding that um, that you might be interested in either witnessing or, um, or supporting in other ways. Hey. Right. Thank you. I'm looking, I'm waiting for some more questions to come up. That's a oh, beautiful comment. I don't know if you're seeing all of these, Emily. Yes, I see one. Um, the, let's see, from Terry, how can we guide the conversation beyond abortion as the only issue? Um, I feel that sometimes that's used as a way to shut down the conversation. Um, I'm, I struggle with the how part of that question myself. And um, I, I also teach in the area, excuse me, of, of sexual ethics and sexual violence. And one of the, um, one of the ways that we've been trying to raise awareness about the complexity of reproductive justice more broadly is that often there's not a lot of attention to um, the precarity of women's experiences at various stages um, of their reproductive lives. So thinking about it, not just in this like hyper politicized context, um, but thinking for example, of the intersections of racism and um, reproductive justice, when we think about access to healthcare, when we think about, you know, speaking about healthcare as a human right, when we think about maternal mortality that is highest among communities of color, for example, um, what does it mean to, you know, support nutrition assistance programs and childcare programs? Well, you know, that's, that's one of these areas of reproductive justice that we, I think, could have um, you know, much more support for if we, if we framed it in the context of um, what does it mean to be compassionate to people in need? What does it mean to affirm the, and empower, you know, women who are already making very difficult choices and trying to figure out how to make ends meet? Um, so, so I think looking at, you know, whether it's, I mean, I, Sexism remains one of the problems that I think we just need to name within a clerical system, but also um, sometimes seeing the connections between racism and healthcare access or racism and the childcare question, you know, can sort of prod us towards thinking about um, the way that sin is functioning here. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, the next question comes from Simone Arias. How can we get educational leadership to see that low expectations for certain students is an aspect of racism? Support is one thing, but not expecting students to have the ability to achieve is another serious problem we face. I am so glad that you named that. It's the, the racism of low expectations, right? It's, and um, I think part of this um, needs to be addressed in the context of professional development um, for teachers and for administrators, but it's, it, it's a multi-layered problem. And, and I'm not an expert in educational policy. I'll, I'll say that from the beginning. Um, but I, I do think that, it, that naming it as um, a problem of um, naming it as a problem of racism is, is very important because that helps us to dissect it and it helps us to understand how we can diagnose it and solve it together. Um, one of the ongoing concerns is the way that um, education funding is tied to property, um, property values. Um, and so we need bigger systemic reform in the ways that public education is funded. That's, that's one you know, major concern 
Um, and, uh, you know, then of course you have all kinds of special interests at stake when you start to talk about how that might be reformed. Um, and whiteness, you know, in terms of thinking about um, real estate or thinking about what it means to describe your neighborhood as livable and safe, you know, all of that kind of language could also be coded as, as racialized. And so I think for a lot of us, um, thinking through these problems through a lens of racialization is, is going to be uncomfortable at first. It might mean rethinking, well, how am I complicit in a system that's racist that is leading to the suffering of vulnerable others when I didn't even intend that? I just wanted to send my kids to a good performing school. I wanted to be sure that my family was living in a safe neighborhood, but then thinking through what that means in terms of how we're participating in um, sinful social structures that I think raises some very challenging questions for those of us who identify as Christian. Um, and so thinking about that, you know, in the context of um, local reforms, as well as, you know, uh, state and, and, and perhaps even federal kinds of reforms, how are we going to use our power um, to work for um, strategic change in some of these areas? Thank you, Emily. I'm going to encourage a few more questions while I read a few comments. Okay. Um, this comes from Anita. Anti-abortion but pro-war dropping 10,000 bombs on people, including children. Hypocrisy. And then she followed it up with anti-abortion used to punish women for being sexual. Yes, I... Um, what... What the bishops of the Catholic Church would say is that they are affirming a consistent ethic of life from cradle to grave. And this term, the consistent ethic of life, um, has, uh, you know, ha has, has stuck around since Cardinal Bernadine started to use this language of the seamless garment, you know, uh, 40 plus years ago. So when they use that language, then that means they are connecting um, anti-poverty, uh, anti-war, um, anti-death penalty advocacy, uh, and you know access to healthcare um, with their approach to um, anti-abortion policies. And and in that logic, then the reverence for life and the valuing of all life as sacred, um, you know, is compelling for a lot of people. But as I hear um, Anita's critique here, the, the hypocrisy from the perspective of a lot of feminist theologians is to say, well, you know, um, the rhetoric doesn't always match the reality. And women are making very difficult choices in situations of constraint um, we haven't addressed sufficiently, for example, gender-based violence. And so we have a lot of women who experienced unplanned pregnancies, including pregnancies as a result of, of sexual violence or lack of um, sexual education that's comprehensive. And what does it mean to be compassionate for women in those very vulnerable situations? Can we really expect parenthood of all women who are facing unplanned, uh, you know, unplanned pregnancies right now. And so what, what does a compassionate approach look like? How do we talk about the sacredness of life from cradle to grave, but also you know, compassion for this woman right now in this particular tragic situation or difficult situation? And you know, I think reproductive justice advocates have actually done a lot to surface some of those very compelling stories. Um, and again, I, I do think that an intersectional analysis that attends to race, class, gender, um, and you know, documentation like citizenship status, you know, all of those layers of identity and power and oppression together, you know, really is important. Um, instead of just looking at abortion as a single issue that's going to trump other issues. Thank you, Emily. We have another question. How do you respond to people who say all lives matter? Well, so that's a great question. I mean, I do think that that has definitely been twisted in the political context. Um, and, and so I, I, 
I'm concerned about that. But um, in the theological framing of the preferential option for the vulnerable, you know, it, what that what that principle means is not that God loves some beings more than others, um, but rather that God recognizes that some are more vulnerable and more in need of urgent attention. Mm. And so, you know, Dr. Massingale, who I quoted earlier, uses this metaphor of, you know, a mother who has three children and one has a fever of 103. And so what is the mother to do right now? Well, of course, the, the mother is going to give attention to the child with the fever of 103. You know, maybe the other two can sit in front of Dora the Explorer for a little while while she takes care of the child who has 103 fever, gets the nurse on the phone, gets the medicines administered, you know, extra TLC. It doesn't mean that the mother loves the other two children less or wants their safety any less, but rather that the child who is most in need right now is most deserving of the mother's care. And so if we were to apply that kind of metaphor in this context, and it would be to say, well, of course all lives matter, but we need to focus right now on the lives that are most threatened. And in the context of um, police brutality and systemic racism, there's evidence that the black community is most in need of our attention and urgent care. And so it, you know, that's the kind of theological framework that we might use and apply. All right, I'm not seeing any questions, but we have another comment from the San Diego Racial Justice Coalition. All lives don't matter until black lives matter. I think they're supporting what you just shared. Yeah. Yes, it's another, I think um, that is said really well from the San Diego Racial Justice Coalition. It's a, it's a, another framing of it is to say, you know, um, my flourishing is bound up in your flourishing. So we can't truly be flourishing unless both of us are flourishing. So I like the way that that twists it, that it doesn't become a negative, but rather a positive. Our, our, um, our freedom is tied together. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know who first said that. I might be quoting Audre Lorde without being able to reference it exactly. But you know, to say that our freedom is tied together um, is a really powerful idea. So I think the San Diego Racial Justice Coalition is really onto something there. All right, I think we have uh, time for one more question. I'm going to give a, just a little bit of wait time to encourage one last question. And you may type that in the chat. I want to apologize again for not forwarding my slides earlier, um, but I, I'm so glad that you noted that so that we could get back on track. It worked out fine. It totally worked out fine. Um, uh, Terry, I don't think there's any more questions. Um, Monique did a, uh, a, a private chat to me where she was said that there's a um, description of, um, let's see, uh, um, forensic science um, has a description of what Jesus really looked like, and it, it was he was dark skinned with um, uh, tight, short hair and tight curls. A oh, middle, a dark, sporty, image. Yeah. Middle Eastern man with uh, with uh, short hair and dark curls. Um, so um, that sort of relates a little bit to the talk. You know what you mentioned earlier about people. Uh, at least Americans in thinking of um, Jesus as being white. All right, we do just have a few questions I'd like to squeeze in. Okay. Is, from, is that okay, Virginia? Yeah, we got a couple more minutes. Okay. Simone Arias, how do you um, think having ch students say they are of one race, but they may be of many? Um, so that's a good question. I think 
one of the things that activists um, or advocacy groups are really struggling with even this came up a lot in the census, but it, it applies in other contexts is the difficulty of expressing the completeness of one's identity by checking a box mm -hmm. and how constraining that is and limiting. Um, and yet for social scientists, the value of that self-identification and stratification, you know, in terms of the different boxes um, and ways to identify um, can be helpful in building stronger coalitions and certainly in the context of, you know, the attachment of population growth to representation um, and to resources, you know, then there are also other ways that, that the census does have power in communities. So it's a very fine line where, you know, we see important aspects of why, why we need to resist, you know, sort of putting our identity in a box. And yet on the one hand, really encourage people to participate in things like that kind of tracking um, because of the way that it can influence, um, you know, for example, that it, that it can raise up and empower um, previously marginalized groups to be able to have more representation um, in elected government, for example. Um, and, and so I think there's a there's a both and um, within that within that challenge. So in the in the sense of, you know, if it's possible to check more than one box, then that is obviously ideal because there are so many people whose experiences through, uh, you know, through marriage and through the messiness of of families and um, as we experience them today. Um, you know, in different kinds of family experiences, uh, that it's important for people to be able to, I, to, to name their identity, you know, in that might mean multiple boxes to check. Um, you know, and so I think that it is preferable to be able to identify, you know, in more than one way. And yet sometimes there's, you know, a rationale for limiting that within a particular survey. Um, and yeah. I don't know if I should say more than that. Let's see. Um, are a question. Okay. Are there other microaggressions we could discuss? Someone mentioned, how do we tell someone we think they are articulate? Yeah, so one of the things that we want to avoid is uh, stereotyping or using um, false and, and offensive categories to describe someone. So what's problematic about um, expressing surprise that someone is well-spoken or articulate or speaks English so well um, is that underneath that is a cutting remark that you didn't expect them to be that well-spoken or to have the vocabulary that they had or to be able to speak in complete sentences or you know, speak in English so well. And that is also carrying meaning that could be dehumanizing. And so I think that offering compliments to someone that are genuine compliments should of course be the goal and, and we're gonna mess up sometimes. Um, but anytime someone says, to you, well, that could, that offended me, you know, I, I'm offended by that, then that's when in terms of recognizing oneself as um, trying to practice, you know, uh, anti-racism, that's when it's important in Alua's words to apologize and recognize the hurt that has been caused um, and seek to, to make amends and even have a conversation in the moment as, you know, uncomfortable as that might be to say, gosh, I didn't intend it that way, but I recognize that the intent is separate from the harm caused. And I don't want to make this about myself. I, you know, I, I really just was trying to compliment you. And I, I need to think about a better way to say that um, so that it comes across as a genuine compliment, because that's the way that I meant it. Um, and so there can be a way where you can, you know, try to express whatever the compliment was that you wanted to express, but uh, but apologize um, and, and apologize meaningfully, not in a defensive way. I, that's what she's trying to suggest as an anti-racist practice. 
So, you know, in terms of like grading papers, I love to write in the comments, you know, wow, that's so interesting, or this paragraph is organized so clearly. You know, sometimes in grading, we have the sandwich critique. I think marriage counselors use this where you say one positive thing and then you, you know, have a constructive comment and then you end with something um, that's also very positive. And so, you know, depending on the context the, the sandwich method could be very helpful too. If there's a need to offer some kind of constructive feedback, be sure we sandwich it between some, you know, authentic positive comments as well. That's really uh, helpful advice, um, Emily. I really appreciate it because I think a lot of times um, we are, um, I, that advice about living with your discomfort and, and apologizing and saying it's not about me and so on and then um, following up. Um, I, I think that we all, we all need to um, absorb that, those techniques a lot more. So. Um, we need to wrap up now. So that was our last question. Um, and I just want to go on to say a bunch of things. First, that um, this has just been an incredibly powerful talk. You covered so much important information in such a deep way. And um, we are going to have the uh, recording. I've already had people say, can we get a copy of this presentation? I know I did like I, I was trying to capture some of the words on your slides. Um, and the references, you referred to a lot of great books and so on. So a recording of this Zoom will be available on the uh, stpaulcathedral.org website. So stpaulcathedral.org slash women dash together, or you go to connect women together and it will be available on the website in a few days. Um, we have to you know, put, post it, the cathedral staff has to do that. But thank you so much for this absolutely amazing uh, uh, talk. I, um, so much information and so much um, deep thought. And um, I know I will be leaning into my discomfort more and um, apologizing more and working to center people of color more while I stand back. And a lot of the things you suggested um, within this wonderful context that you've given us. So. I just can't thank you enough. It's just, it's been a, an amazing talk. Um, and unfortunately though, we have to end. Um, so before the closing prayer, I have a few announcements. Um, uh, we are, um, uh, we would like donations. So I have to ask each time we normally, um, uh, have dinners and that's how we make most of our income. So uh, with no dinners, with just doing everything on Zoom. Um, if you like our talks, please go to the Women Together page on the stpaulcathedral.org website. If you go to look for the video, down at the bottom of that page is a donate now button and go ahead and donate. Any amount is appreciated, even $5. Um, it will help us continue to do these programs. Um, uh, Terry posted in the chat, our online evaluation form, uh, a link in the chat, but uh, we will be sending out to the same mailing list that got the Zoom link, um, a copy of the chat, as which has a bunch of information in it and um, the questions and so on. And also um, the um, a link to the evaluation form. So um, people who have attended will get that in an email as well in the next um, day or two. And um, this is the last event of our Women Together season. Um, so please watch for publicity in the fall for our first um, session in, on October 7th of 2021. We take the summer off. Um, our program development committee has been working very hard and has come up with some amazing um, ideas for speakers and events for next year. Um, there's gonna be an exciting slate of diverse people, we hope. And um, we are optimistic that there's a chance we may be able to meet in person and uh, we may even be able to enjoy having dinners together. So that would be really something. Um, look for publicity in the fall, probably in September for our meetings in October and, and then forth in, in the years of, in 2021, 2022. So I wanna say one more time, a very big thank you to all the volunteers <clears throat> who make this happen. 
and um, the clergy and cathedral staff behind the scenes who uh, do the recording and the Zoom and you know lots and lots of things um, go into making these events happen. And um, and I know uh, many of us will be cherishing this particular um, talk and wanting to rewatch it on video and talking to each other about it um, in the next days and weeks. And and in addition to that, I wanted to remind people because it's been posted in the chat, but. Um, the cathedral is on, continuing from sacred ground to a program called sacred ground in action which will have some advice about what to do kind of like um emily was talking about how do we as as christian women um do our part to to work on these issues and so sacred ground in action is coming keep an eye out for that um and um so with that um let us pray grant O oh god that your holy and life-giving spirit may so move every human heart that barriers which divide us may crumble suspicions disappear and hatred cease that our divisions being healed we may live in justice and peace through jesus christ our lord Amen. And now if anyone wants to stay and unmute and chat, we'll, we'll keep the session open for five or 10 more minutes. So please, if you're just dying to say something out loud, go ahead and, and talk. And thank you all so much for coming. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Really was wonderful to see you all. Thank you. Uh, good night. Thank you so much. Um, it's just been, um, it's just been brilliant. I, um, I don't know if you saw the comments in the chat, but there've been. I did, yes, it was, I was very affirmed and uh, <laughs> I look forward to, yes, continuing um, I... this anti-racist work together. So. Good, that's great. Uh, it, it really has been a wonderful addition to a lot of the, the, the conversations that have already been going on at the cathedral. So you've just, you added to and filled out and, and took forward, I think, um, ideas that people have been talking about. And so it's just been, been really, really powerful. And we really appreciate it. Well, Anybody you've else? enough tonight. So I, I'm going to let all of you speak <laughs> now. Thank you, Emily. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you. You really packed a lot in, you know, like uh, there was a, a framework for it all. And it, it correlates with other things that we've been learning. But you also gave some real practical kinds of things that um, I, I really appreciated how many different elements you, you put in. Um, you did a great job for all of us that are all on different places on this journey too. So thanks, <laughs> thanks a lot. I'd like to thank Emily and I'd also like to thank Virginia for sending me the uh, link for tonight. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> I keep an eye out uh, <laughs> for people who need the link at the last minute. Oh, Anita, we can't hear you. You were talking, but you're muted. Mute. Okay. Uh, Emily, you have found your calling. That's all I can say. My goodness. You're waking us up in, in just a powerful, powerful way. And I just thank God for your, for you, just for you. I could just feel and look and see the Christ in you. I really could. Wow. You, that. <laughs> absolutely amazing mind-blowing wow <laughs> thank you thank you thank you that's all i can say god bless you and thank you to all of you who made it happen thank you thank you any other thoughts you have to unmute yourself if you want to talk Could I just say one more thing? 
Sure. Uh, regarding abortion, uh, it's a way to uh, punish women and control women. And forever, middle class women and upper class women have had access to abortion. It's a private issue between themselves and their doctor and their family. And, and I, it's only poor women now that are being penalized. And, uh, and the hypocrisy is also that they force you to have the baby and then they don't give you money once the baby's born, you're on your own. And so that's, that is just hypocritical on so many levels, but that's my thought. But it would be wonderful if we were all consistent, no war, no capital punishment, no need to abort any babies, that would be wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Is it Maureen Day that said something like a, a child born, but not a child fed or a child cared for? Or what? I don't know. The right, list. right, it's, right. It's, um, it's not life. It's not affirming life. I don't know. Do you know the quote, Emily? No, but I know Maureen Day. I was nodding. That sounds like something Maureen would say. <laughs> something like a, a, a child, a child born, but not you know, a child fed or a child clothed right, or child housed. Right, right. Is, I mean, look at Brazil. There's no abortion there. And there are children living in the streets, babies. I mean, they're just abandoned. You know, they're, they're, it's just horrific. It's just horrific. So every child should be wanted. And you could have a woman that's been married for, for 15, 20 years who accidentally gets pregnant but can't get an abortion. And is forced, is mandated to have this baby. So... Anyway, but yeah, we all have that was a powerful point that you made, Emily. That um, the focus, if there's too much of a focus on abortion as the single issue, it does not allow room for the really much bigger issues that have to do with with real justice and and right. affirmation of life. Right. The abortion question is so divisive and so complex and. Um, and I, so in my own work, I'm trying to connect it to, you know, women's experience of reproduction more broadly, not only in the context of unplanned pregnancies, but also, um, the realities of miscarriage and in Great. some of those cases, yeah. the precise the medicines that women need when they are experiencing miscarriage have been so politicized that their own health is becoming endangered through um, the, the hyper-politicized you know, context about abortion. And that's, it's even having more of a negative impact on women and their ability to access medical care um, we, even when the woman wanted and would have, you know, would have treasured the child, but through no fault of her own, you know, is experiencing a spontaneous abortion. And so it's just, it's so complicated. And, and the Catholic healthcare system really has um, a lot of power and control, you know, one in six or some say one in seven patients are in a Catholic healthcare system. And so there are a lot of women who experience some limitations of care um, because of the, you know, the kind of healthcare system that's closest to their home. And so I, I think that this is one of those, one of those issues that is not going away. And yet I'm, I find myself always trying to find this, you know, kind of strategic point where people could reach common ground on an issue, but it remains really polarizing and complex right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, could I, could I uh, uh, share something with you? I've been taking sacred ground and, uh, and two ideas popped up to me last week. Uh, and one was that um, the Holocaust in Nazi Germany lasted about five years. But the Holocaust for Black people in this country has lasted 400 years. I mean, this is an American Holocaust. And the other thing that popped into my mind, and I don't know how to do it. You know, we've had uh, Chicano history. We've had Native American history. 
but it's like white people need to learn all those histories. And I was thinking, how would we frame that? Um, white Americans in relation to um, Native American history or something so that we could frame it that it, it isn't just an elective, that it must be brought into the regular uh, curriculum. And I don't know how to do that and, and make it, you know, we have to start somewhere to say, this is not just about slavery and, and black Africans, you know, African-Americans or native, native people or Chicano history, but it's like, it's intertwined with our history and the brutality that they all faced from us. You know, it's like, so we need to somehow integrate that and have the courage to say, as you said, some people may be very uncomfortable when they hear this. And it is a shock sometimes. You go, oh my God, did we really treat people that terrible? Did, you know, our ancestors really do that to other human beings? And, the, the, you know, but other countries have faced it. South Africa, mm -hmm. Germany. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think there are other places. But how do we get that into the regular curriculum? so that we can wake up. It hurts, but it's like a scab. You have to rip it off, you know, <laughs> before it can heal. I mean, you know, and it's, it's a grieving process. As someone said, all the stages, is it all the stages of grieving, the six stages? And that's what we will go through, you know? Mm -hmm. And and I did, I did read something which said, um, we are not responsible for what our ancestors did. We were not alive then, but we are responsible for what happens in our generation, you know, and we do benefit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anita, but, Anita, I, sorry to interrupt you, but I think, um, I think we, it's time for us to let Emily go. <laughs> okay. worked very hard and, and she's done amazing presentations. So. Right. Thank you for your comments well, and questions. Well, you saved me because I don't have a good, an easy answer to that question. <laughs> I know you don't. None of us do, really. It's None a good question. Do. That just have to have much be... work to do on education. But yeah. really, yeah. this was such a wonderful opportunity to, to meet you all. So um, uh -huh. you have a wonderful group. Thank you for letting me be a part of it tonight. Thank good you night. so much. Thank Mind you so much, Emily. Good night. <laughs>